Hey gang, welcome back. We're talking solids again. We're talking transverse shear today. Explained, I hope. <laughs> this is something that I think is very, very confusing. If you just read the textbook and, on transverse shear and you're like, what? What are we talking about here? We're talking about shear stress. Now we've talked about shear stress way early in this whole uh, course, right? We got this guy here. Tau equals V over A. Well, today we have a new equation, and it is this. Tau equals VQ over IT, or as my students call it, the Vickett equation, okay? You got to know about the Vickett equation. So is that Tau different than that Tau? I'm fixing to tell you, and after this, you're going to be like, no question, I got it, okay? So first off, what does the word transverse mean, okay? Think about your car. Here's two different kinds of cars. You've got your uh, rear wheel drive car and your front wheel drive car. This is a conventional way to mount an engine so that the drive shaft is along the axis of the car. Transverse means perpendicular or crossways, if you will, right? So in a transverse mounted engine, instead of mounting in the conventional direction, the engine is mounted sideways, and that's how front wheel drive cars work. So that transverse word means kind of uh, sideways. So we're thinking about shear. Uh, I'll give you an example, right? We think about shear. So if I have a little beam like this guy, a little wooden beam, okay, is if I put a load on that beam, it's trying to tear it in half, right? If I push down on it, huah, I'm trying to rip that beam in half. You know, that's how that's how shears work. How do how do the how do scissors work? Well, on one side, this side is pushing down on the paper, while this side is pushing up on the paper. And basically, it's a controlled tear, isn't it? It just shears the material in half. And that's what we talk about when we're talking about shear in a beam. So, I think for the most part, everybody kind of understood uh, what shear stress was. Like, uh, here's, a, here's one of my, 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 uh, my noodle beam, okay? So if I push down on one side and up on the other side, I get this kind of a tearing action like that, and that would be shearing, right? And we got that from V over A. V being the shear force, how much force is trying to tear my beam in half, and A being that cross-sectional area there, right? Well, it turns out that this guy over here, right, is what we call average shear stress. And I'm here to tell you that this is the same tau as this guy down here, which it doesn't seem like it, and I'm gonna show you uh, why, okay? So this tau, this is average, and I say that the way to think about this is, this is shear at a specific point, okay? Whereas this is like average across the whole face, this will tell you the shear value at any point on the beam. Now, let me, let me give you an example of that. So I want you to imagine a beam as being made up of a whole bunch of small layers. Do you remember we had a slinky example before? We said that when we talk about shear, due to torsion, that each layer of that slinky would slide one layer relative to the next. Well, we have that same kind of configuration here. So what I've got here, I've got this all balanced, is a bunch of boards, and I've sawed it, right, where there's just a whole bunch of layers. Now, I have come in here, and I have drawn a bunch of vertical lines on this board, okay? Now, as I put a load on this board, right, you're going to see this board deflect. But what are happening to these layers as it deflects? Let me push on pretty hard here, okay? Can you look at the ends? Can you see what's going on? Are those are the lines that are straight up and down? Are they still straight up and down? Or are they are they? You can see where they have um, segmented, right? Those lines are sliding one relative to the next, right? Now, if I pull that back, it goes back, right? So that is transverse shear. It is shearing this way on the beam, not this way in which we think, right? Now let's look at that right quick. So as I bend that board, that beam, right, what's happening is, is these layers are sliding across each other, one relative to the next. So even if you have a beam that's not sawed, right, like this direction, right, imagine as I bend that, 
those layers are trying to, those fibers of the wood, right, are trying to slide across each other in this direction, one relative to the next, right? And we can see that in the example where I just bent this, right? So as I bend this, they're sliding like so, okay? That's the transverse direction, not what we typically think of this way. So wait a minute, how does V over A, which we talked about being this way, equate to now the force is going this way? Seems like I'm adding apples and oranges here, right? An X force to a Y force, or a, an X shear to a Y shear. That doesn't make much sense to me, okay? Let me, let me see if this makes sense to you, okay? Okay, so the first thing, let's just talk about what are the components in this equation here, okay? So what are those components? Well, you've got V, which is the shear force, okay? And that's going to be in something like newtons or pounds or kilonewtons or kips or something like that, right? It's a force, okay? Then you've got Q. And if you don't get Q, go back and watch my video that says, what the heck is Q, right? I think that's the name of the video, right? And I'll explain to you what Q is. It's the first area moment uh, of inertia, okay? And Q is, remember this guy, Y bar is equal to the sum of the YA's divided by the sum of the A's. Remember that from statics, the old centroid equation? Q is just this up here, okay? It's the top half of the centroid equation. So Q equals the sum of the Y times A's. Again, if you don't get that, go watch that video and explain what that is, because it's a very challenging concept for students to get. We're going to use Q here a lot. And then, of course, we know what I is. I is the second area moment uh, of inertia. Okay? And that is a, a geometric property of the cross-section uh, of a beam that uh, tells it's resistance to bending, right? Of course, the last one, in T, is just the thickness of the beam. So I always think about the thickness of the beam as the amount that I would have to tear through, right? So if I'm going to transverse shear this way, right, what, what am I going to have to, what thickness of the beam am I going to have to tear through to make those layers slide? Well, in this case, the thickness would be this width right here, right? That would be the thickness, okay? In the case of our I-beam here, right, this is the thickness here. Well, this would be the thickness up here, wouldn't it, right? So it depends on which point I'm asking you to find it at. So let's say this is our neutral axis, okay? Then, th remember what this is called? This is called the web. This is called the flange, okay? This would be T up here, this would be T down there. Now this is over here, what I've got is a transverse shear stress plotted, right? So this is, here's the cross section of the beam. This would be like looking at the end of the beam, if the beam was going this way, right? So what's going on over here? Well, look at this. As in the middle, right, at the neutral axis right here, that's where the shear stress is greatest. Why is it greatest? Because Q, would be all of this up here, right? It's Y times A above the point of interest. So if the point of interest is here on the neutral axis, Q would be as big as it can be. Q is always as big as it can possibly be when you're on the neutral axis, okay? As I go up on the part, right, is I, if I'm here, right, well now Q is only this top part up here, right? So Q just got a little smaller. It's not this bit down here, right? So as Q gets smaller, um, the shear gets smaller, okay? Now, what happens when I go right here, when I get to this part right here where the, where the web meets the flange? Well, what happens to T right here? I jump from a small thickness, wham, to a big thickness, right? And so you get this discontinuity, whoop, and then the, the stress is very small. Now, the closer I get to the outside of the part, right, as I get closer and closer to the outside of the part, guess what? Q is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until I get to the outside of the part, then Q is zero, and transverse shear, consequently, is zero. Now, let me just explain to you what, how I think of transverse shear, okay? I think of it in terms of uh, 
Newton's third law, right? To every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So this thing wants to tear along this transverse direction, right? Here in the middle, right? In the middle, I have the most material above me to resist that tearing, right? And as I get closer and closer to the outside, now I only have this much material up here to resist that tearing, right? I don't have anybody to oppose me. When I get to the very top, how much material is above that to oppose me? Zero, right? So as so in, in the middle, I have the most structure to oppose that shearing. And that's why the shear stress is highest there. When I get to the outside, there's nobody to oppose me. And so the shear stress goes to zero on the outside of the part. That's kind of the way I think of that. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay, now, let's go. And then one more thing here, and that is that V over A is the average. So what I can do is I, with this equation, I can calculate the shear stress anywhere. You want to know what it is right there? I'll tell you. You want to know what it is right there? I'll tell you. Why is that important to me? As an engineer, if I'm, to, if I'm designing something to support a load, what am I concerned with? Am I concerned with the average shear stress? Or am I concerned with where does that absolute maximum shear stress, what is that? Because that's the thing I don't want to fail, right? I want that, I want to design for that max. So that max is maybe here, right? So whereas if I add all of these little arrows together, right, maybe I get like an average here. Okay, there's my, maybe my average shear stress, okay? Yeah, average is good for little quick estimates and that kind of thing, but, it, but if, as an engineer, I want to design for that worst case, don't I? Now, for 99% of beams out there, the worst case shear stress is always going to happen at the neutral axis because that's where Q is the biggest. Now, there are some very weird beams out there where the thickness varies. It's small here and it's big in the middle and it would flip and then the neutral axis is not where the maximum will be. But that's a very strange beam and it's a very obscure case for this. 99% of the time, maximum shear stress happens at the neutral axis, okay? All right, so what? So one more note before we wrap this video up and that is this, okay? I know what you're thinking, Dr. Hanson, wait a minute. I still don't understand how a shear in this direction, transverse, equals a shear in this direction across the face of the material. Let's see if this clears it up. Okay, let's say that on that, where those two beams are shearing in half, right? Where these two beams are shearing in half. I looked at a little bitty tiny piece of material right on that shearing surface, okay? So maybe, here he is. Okay, there's that little piece of material, okay? It's getting sheared. Now you know this, don't you? You know that, that little, there's no such thing as a 2D piece of material. It's a little piece of a 3D, it's a little volume, isn't it? Okay, so imagine this. Whenever we, whenever we sketch, whenever we sketch our str uh, stress elements, okay, what do we do? We do this number here, right? We say, hey, this is normal stress, okay, normal, and then here are those shear stresses, okay? Why do the shear stresses go to the corners and meet each other? Well, they have to because of because their reaction there's an equal and opposite reaction. Otherwise, if they didn't. These little stress elements would be spinning, wouldn't they, right? This one, you know, if I pull on you that way, somebody has to pull on me that way. If I push up, then somebody has to pull down, right? So let's just say that I had this. I had transverse shear in this direction. That's my layers of board sliding this way, right? Well, what has to be the case across this front face, which is this way? What has to be happening there? It has to be the same size as that transverse shear. And then, of course, there's going to be one on this side over here on this face and one down here on the bottom on that face, right? So the transverse shear is equal to the shear on this face over here. They have to be the same value. And that's the best explanation of, of what I think is a very confusing thing. I can see the transverse shear this way. But how does that equate to a shear this way, like my scissors cutting, right? Well, because if I'm a little element there, I'm a little volume element cube, what, what shear am I experiencing? 
on one surface this way, on the other surface it has to be the same amount, but in an opposite direction because of Newton's third law, right? Every action there's an equal opposite reaction. Otherwise, because if, if I sum the, the torque up, the moment on this cube, it would be spinning if that wasn't the case, wouldn't it? Okay? And I think that's the best way I can describe to you what transverse shear is. Now stay tuned, we're going to do an example problem in the next video, and we're going to put this guy to the test, and we're going to see what is transverse shear at several points on the beam and how we work that. So I just want to explain to you what transverse shear is, and in the next video I'll explain to you how we use it to solve some problems, okay? All right, I hope this explains it for you, and I'll see you on the next video.